Okay, this is going to be a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to put a whole bunch of truth in your face. And it all lines up with the stuff I've been telling you. I've been telling people for a long time now that don't want to hear it. No, I don't care if you don't want to hear it. It doesn't change the reality. It doesn't change the facts. Okay, and I know this stuff is real truth, and I don't really don't care what anybody thinks because I'm not going to sugarcoat anything to protect somebody's feelers. I mean, we're in where we're at right now because of what's going down. And what's going down, well, we're the ones that sat back and allowed this to happen. So let's go forward. I'm going to play this, and I'm sure you'll recognize what you're looking at right there. So let's go forward here and get this crap out of my way there. Now that part right there, Marion produce, they don't want that no more. See, that's because this is old. Okay, they don't want that anymore. They don't want Marion, they don't want producing. They want to control the producing. That's right, the powers to be do not want men and women together producing. They want to control that. But just the same, this movie had one heck of a lot of truth in it. Stay asleep. Right, bye. Right, watch TV. Consume. Yeah. No. Now this part here is very crucial. You better pay attention. I've been telling everybody the tool, the root of all evil. The reason they've gotten what they've gotten right now is right here. I've been screaming this at people, okay, and you just don't get it. Maybe you'll get it when you hear this because this is the real mentality. And this is why we're, we're right right now. This is how the powers to be, the 13 families, the banksters, the mafia, the syndicate, because that's who runs you. This is how they got where they're at right now. This is why they are doing what they're doing, because you are perfectly bent over, bent over I hate to say it, but you are, and you're not understanding what's really take, what's taken place. So this clip here is very crucial. You need to hear this. Yeah, you got to listen to me. I thought you boys understood. It's business. That, that's all it is. You still don't get it, do you, boys? There ain't no countries anymore. No more good guys. They're running the whole show. They own everything, the whole goddamn planet. They can do whatever they want. What's wrong with having it good for a change? Now, they're going to let us have it good if we just help them. They're going to leave us alone. Let's make some money. You can have a little taste of that good life, too. Now, I know you want it. Hell, it Yep, you can have a good a little taste of that good life, too. All you got to do is sell out your people. That's right. We could give you lots of a man-constructed thing. 
That's right. Lots of what a man created. That's right. Controlled by 13 families. Called money. Everybody does. Do it to your own kind. What's the threat? We all sell out every day. Might as well be on a winning team. There you are. What did I tell you about the arenas? What did I tell you about the first sport arena that ever come in? That's right. It was never for entertainment. It was about changing your perceptions. And that's why it branched off from a sports arena to a television set to the workplace and into the dating scene. So that you would all have that mindset that everything is competition. Everything is competing. And here it is right in your face. See where they've used the tool? And this is what you're looking at right here is what's really taking place. This is how they got what they've got. Because so many people went with what this guy said right here in real life for real. Why do you need seven officers from the division of the police that are trained for firearms to come out and issue a thousand pound civil fine? Why? For me, that makes no sense. That wasn't the choice of the officers. That was clearly the choice of somebody senior. That's a scare tactic for me. You know, we've been talking about this virus, but no one's been talking about how we can get healthier. And then to go ahead and shut down a gym, which is, you know, a primary source for mental health, physical health, is frustrating, right? We had a visit. Oh, by the way, I'll stop this for one second. What you're watching now is London Real. What you're watching now is deception. That's right. Deception, deceiving you, reporting BS to you. Best thing in the morning when they opened, they'd come back. He's like, look, we've had orders from the boss's boss's boss that we need to enforce this hard. So obviously the threatened to hit me with an £80,000 fine a day. The orders come from, obviously, central governments, and they were being forced to enforce a piece of legislation that they know is unjust. I said, guys... You know, it's full of customers. I'm not asking my paying customers to stop in the middle of what they're doing. I'm really sorry. We're going to have to give you the fine. We're back in business. You know, our, our sector can thrive. The science speaks for itself. You know, we've got decades and decades of data that evidence how important health and fitness is, how important nutrition is. If you're trying to take this epidemic seriously, and if you're trying to take our health service seriously, why are you not taking our sector seriously? So. I want you to pay attention to something here. When I'm telling you this is deception. See from 9-11 to Sandy Fluke. <laughs> That's right. To the Parkland event. Yeah. To all of the FEMA military exercise drills that were shoved all over mainstream media. See they love using symbolism, they love using numbers, and they love using colors. They've been doing this forever. And the color they love to use when they're deceiving you, and it's thrown all over the media worldwide, is standing in your face right now. Purple. Purple is the elite's color of deception. It's the, it's the color they use when they're deceiving you. So pay attention to Mr. Brian Ross, who's running for mayor over London, that just happens to be where the World Bank is in London, that just happens to be the Rothschild dynasty. That's right, the kingpin of the bankers. And what's Brian Ross doing? Oh, that's right, he's running for mayor. And he's trying to make himself look good. And he wants you to believe that worldwide we're fighting back. See the color right there in your face? Did you pay attention to that? Did you see the color? Oh, look at here, the same color. How neatly folded his hanky is in his pocket. Oh, it was nice that he would wear a purple tie with a purple. That's not an accident. Anybody that's really awake knows this is deception. This is BS. That's what that is. This guy's working with him. What do you think? He's where he's at. 
because he's a deceiver. He's a liar. How did he become that? Because it's all right to sell out people for the tool. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with deceiving people and selling everybody out for the tool money. So we've created a, not much of a national but a global movement for what's right. He didn't allow the powers at play to... See, he created a global movement and didn't allow the powers to be. Do you catch the deception going on here? You should, if you're awake. We divide our community. The world is changing. Inspiration is everywhere. It has never been so easy to connect, share, and bring people together. Oh, it's never been so easy to connect. Really? Really? That's complete hogwash. Okay, it's complete hogwash. The division is through the roof. You couldn't get nobody to stand together in the truth of the community, in real life on the streets, in the dating arena. No, you can't get nobody to stand together. Well, but we're connected. Look at this. Yeah, you're connected all right. No, you're not. You're more disconnected than ever. But see, they turn everything upside down in their head. Why do you think he was flashing his purple at you? Because this is deception. We're learning from others and finding the best in ourselves. Challenging our beliefs. Sharing our vulnerability. Overcoming our fears. Transforming ourselves. Yep, you're overcoming your fears, all right, by putting a diaper on your face and staying six foot apart, furtherly destroying your immune system. But yet he's going to report the exact opposite to you. He's going to be talking about your health when we're actually doing the exact opposite, upside down on its head again. So we can transform the world. How far can we go? Just think, you all wearing a diaper on your face to protect you from what? While the numbers are going up. With a diaper on your face. This is London Rio. I am Ryan Rose. My guest today is... This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Nick Whitcomb, owner of Body Tech Fitness Gym in Merseyside, also known as the People's Gym. Last week, Liverpool was struck with a Tier 3 lockdown, and five armed police officers attended your gym, issuing you with a thousand-pound fine, with penalties set to increase exponentially with each return visit. But you fought back, keeping your doors open and launching a campaign to overturn the ruling, which you said defied the scientific evidence. Since then, you received international media attention, garnered over 375,000 signatures on a government petition, and raised over 50,000 pounds to cover the legal costs for your cause. Mayors, police forces, and MPs have united in their support for your fight to serve the members of your community, protecting their physical and mental health. Today, you announce your victory and are allowed to legally reopen your gym. Congratulations, and Nick, welcome to London Real. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for having me. Look, it's, it's, it's great having you here. I want to hear about today, and I want to hear about the whole story. But, you know, if anyone's watching, I just want to talk about some of the stats that are there. And, and you've, you've mentioned some of these on your Instagram feed as well. But, you know, Prince William, two days ago, our future King of England, said uh, that we are in the middle of a mental health catastrophe. And in a survey of 70,000 Britons, one in 10 has reported suicidal thoughts during lockdown. And that number doubles for the unemployed. And it also doubles for the youth aged 18 to 24. Um, at the same time, the esteemed Lancet Medical Journal has shown that exercise three times a week can reduce depression by 43%. And some of the figures you threw out there were amazing, Nick. 22 million gym visits, I think, in the last five to six months. Only 78 COVID cases. That's 0.35 out of 100,000. And even Public Health England's own data says transmissions in gyms account for 1.7% of the cases 
I mean, look, hospitality accounts for 3.3%. Don't get me started about that ridiculous lockdown. But look, the, the science was always on your side. And look, this is something dear to my heart. Be honest, you know, when, when we got locked down here, I was training in the stairwells here, you know. And uh, when Virgin opened up down the road, I almost gave everybody a hug and a kiss. And I'm there pretty much every single day. I'm swimming. I just did leg day. It's so important for my own mental health. I've struggled with it in the past. I've struggled with addiction, to drugs, to alcohol. For me, my daily gym time is crucial. So I really appreciate you and your fight. Nick, tell us the big news today, and then walk us through this crazy journey you've had for the last couple weeks. Sure. So the big news we had today, um, I'll be honest, we went to bed feeling pretty deflated last night. Our local MP, Angela Eagle, sat in the house yesterday, and she, she asked the question for us uh, to Mr. Hancock, will you provide the evidence as to why you closed gyms across Merseyside? Um, and she was more or less ignored. Um, so going to bed last night, our, our entire campaign, you know, the 75% of our uh, gym businesses across Merseyside that have stayed open when we thought we were so close to a victory. We went, went to bed last night feeling extremely deflated. You know, we, we thought we had victory. You know, we, we thought we were 99% of the way there. And then to obviously have that happen in the house yesterday was really disappointing. So to wake up to the news this morning, uh, I woke up to a message on Twitter from our mayor, Steve Robert, just saying, check the press. Uh, and the press was that they reversed the decision. They acknowledged that it was wrong. They called it an oversight. Whether it was or not is, you know, it's another discussion. Um, so we're back in business. You know, our, our sector can thrive. The science speaks for itself. You know, we've got decades and decades of data that evidence how important health and fitness is, how important nutrition is. You know, from a not just from a, a physical perspective, but from a mental health perspective, as you say. Um, you know, we know that depression rates are up double from last year. Suicide rates are at an all-time high. You know, we, we've had this data for decades, and it, it, for me, it really begs the question, why has nobody asked the question? You know, why was this even allowed to happen in the first place, and why did it take seven days for it to be reversed? Uh, Remember, this is all about your health, okay? Uh, no one can seem to answer that question for me. Yeah, one of the most frustrating things in the past seven months, Nick, is that, you know, we've been talking about this virus, but no one's been talking about how we can get healthier. There hasn't seemed to be a conversation about training, about diet, about building the immune system, about losing weight, you know, that seems to be completely ignored. And yet, you know, we talk a lot about social distancing and masks and lockdowns, but, you know, the human body seems to me that it's 50, 60, 70, 80% of the equation. And then to go ahead and shut down a gym, which is, you know, a primary source for mental health, this <coughs> is frustrating, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, who knew the health and fitness sector, health and fitness sector is paramount to the health of the country, who knew? Um, but you know, it, it, it's been a long battle, and we don't we don't understand why it's happened. Um, as I say, we've got decades and decades. Oh, I understand why it's happened. I've already showed you why it's happened. Now listen to this. Data, data to support why, and we, we as you say, there's been no mention of getting fitter. Where my question is, where is the workout to help out scheme? And you know, not 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 to be taken out of context there. I'm fully behind the the eat out to help out scheme. I think it's fantastic that we try to get our, our restaurants and our cafes, you know, back on the up. But I think they go hand in hand. And I think if we're really going to try and push our economy, we should have done it hand in hand. There should have been a, a workout to help out alongside an eat out to help out. We should have pushed this hard. I mean, here in here in the UK, we pay our TV license. We have BBC One, BBC Two. How much would it have cost to have a personal trainer spend an hour on BBC once a day? to do a home workout broadcast free to the nation to try and alleviate some of the strain from the NHS to try and alleviate... How much would it cost to get the media worldwide that's owned by the 13 families and controlled by the 13 families that own and control the tool money? How much would it cost just to get somebody on your television set to show you how you can work out while you're locked down in your home. That's right, while you're in prison in your own home. Well, why do you think he says it needs to be on TV? That's right, see how they're flipping everything on you? This is deception. If you don't pay attention to wording, and you don't pay attention to what's really going on, you're going to go right down the rabbit hole, and that's where everybody's went so far as right down the rabbit hole. There's very few people out here that are actually awake, you know, and unfortunately, 
because you've allowed yourself to be deceived, you're being deceived again right here, right now. He just told you how much would it cost to get somebody on TV to show you how you can work out at home for your health. But make sure and put the diaper on your face so you can breathe back in your CO2, poisoning yourself. Make sure and stay distance from people so you won't share bacteria with each other so your immune system will get weaker and weaker. Wow, that's a really healthy fitness plan you got going here. While you're breathing in your CO2, putting a diaper on your face and staying apart from each other, breaking down your immune system with GMO foods, phony vitamins, made by Big Pharma. That's right. Food that's Monsanto's worth engineered seeds that takes all the minerals and vitamins out of your natural crops like fruits and vegetables and stuff that's growing. Yeah. Not even counting the aluminum barrier that's sprayed on them every day from the skies. Deviates, you know, some of the spending that diabetes and obesity costs us. It costs the NHS nine billion a year. It costs wider society 35, 36 billion a year. We could reduce that drastically and no one seems to be asking the question and, and I, I, I honestly can't understand why and nobody who I've engaged with so far from politicians to the, you know, the titans of our industry, nobody can tell me why that there hasn't been a push. If we truly want to protect our NHS, which we should do, why has there not been a bigger emphasis on health and fitness? Why has there not been a bigger emphasis on, on nutritional education? Do you see this? Do you see how they're pushing for your health, pushing for your health while they're deceiving you? That's right, they're deceiving you. They want you to believe the stuff they're talking about is pushing for your health, that they want you to be healthy, when it's actually, in reality, the exact opposite. Meanwhile, there is no excuse for homelessness. There is no excuse for poverty worldwide. No, we're not running out of resources. That's complete hogwash. No, there's no such thing as global warming. You might as well say weather warfare, weather modification. Military industrial complex. There is a global warming right there. All man created. Oh, the shortages. Man created. All you got to do is pay attention to everything that's took place this year while Agenda 21 is coming in. And you'd understand clearly what's going on. But most people don't want to look that far because it scares them. And what's the best way to control people? Scare the kajivas out of them. And because they know you don't pay attention to wording. They already know that you don't have an attention span and you don't have critical thinking skills. It's so easy to fool you. Just so easy. Why are we not? Why is nobody asking these questions? Out of all, all the elected officials across the country, why is not a single person said, we could probably do this better. Let's open a conversation, you know, let's open a dialogue. Let's, let's, let's push the sector that is potentially the, the biggest contributor to allevi alleviating strain from the NHS so we can truly tackle the COVID infection rates and the mortality rates of, you know, no one's asking these questions. Why? And what do you think the answer is, Nick? Do you think there are, you know, strange lobbyists that don't want that to happen? Or do you think it's that a lot of these MPs don't go to the gym themselves? Or do you think they think that the public doesn't want to hear? See, do you like this shield? The very shield who had David Icke on, who actually told you real truth. Did he learn anything from David Icke? No, he didn't, not at all. No. And even with David Icke being most likely a plant, which we all know he is, he's told one heck of a lot of real truth. Real truth. This man knows it. But he's still up here deceiving you. And he had to make sure he put on his purple tie and his purple handkerchief nice and neatly folded in his pocket to stand in your face, knowing that the majority of you won't even know that that stands for deception. So while he's deceiving you with his buddy here who he paid the tool to help him deceive you and then right in your face. Well, if we could get him on TV and we could have somebody blah, blah, blah doing exercises this way when you're locked in your house, in prison, in your own house, imprisoned in your own house, we can deceive you into we're worried about your health. No, they're not. So a deception. Uh, they don't want to be told what to do. What do you think it actually is? I think it's two things. So I think first, first and foremost, and you just put it there, I think it's because next to nobody in the house uses the gym. 
I mean, we know that Mr. Johnson cycled, cycles it spike in the summer to, you know, to number 10 for a bit of good press. Whether he actually, you know, does anything fitness related in his life, I don't know. But we know that he's quick to jump on a bike when the press are there at number 10. Nobody that I can see in the house fits the bill of somebody that takes exercise and nutrition seriously. And if you're trying to take this epidemic seriously, and if you're trying to take our health service seriously, why are you not taking our sector seriously? So my response would be, the first problem is obviously the, 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 the collective of people that we have in charge are not in tune with today's society whatsoever. We, we know that time and time again, they evidence that to us. And they say, for me personally, for my generation, they push us so hard to vote. Why don't you vote? Why do you waste your vote? It's a waste, it's a waste. Well, now more than ever is, it, is, is clearly evident as to why we do not vote. Because you've shown us here in Liverpool that our local MPs have no power. So the central government stated that this was a local decision. Now our local, both our mayors, all of our local MPs, our police have all stood up and said, wait, this had nothing to do with us, this was not our decision, this was central government, we've had this confirmed. And they're just pointing the finger back at our local government saying, no, 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 it's up to them, because they don't want to have to admit they've made a mistake. And I think this is one of the fundamental issues that we have now in Parliament. Nobody is willing to hold their hands up and say, we made a mistake. Which, I'm sure you'd agree with me, Brian, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. You know, it, it, you wouldn't be human if you didn't. And, and we would have more respect for the, the system as a whole if they would just say, guys, we're in a time of national crisis. It's difficult. We've never, we've never enjoyed something like this before. You're actually not in a time of national crisis. Either you are in a time of national crisis or not. You're not in the national crisis for what you're being fed. You're in a national crisis because you're believing in what's being fed to you. You're not taking the time to use critical thinking skills. You're not examining what's going on around you whatsoever. Because if people was, they could have never gotten as far as they did. So we're doing our best. We've made a mistake. We've rectified it. We're now doing the right thing. Not once out of all the mistakes that we've made in the last six months have I heard any of them say, I'm sorry, you made the wrong decision. Let's try a better way. It just seems to be constantly coming up with new ideas, but not accepting that the, prior, the, the previous ideas failed and as to why they failed. And no one seems to be asking the question of how we can do this better. We just seem to be doing the same thing over and over again. And it, 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 it's, it amounts to an insanity, in my opinion. You know, we, we need fresh blood in there. We need fresh ideas. Well, I do agree with that words that it amounts to insanity, because that's our entire world. Completely out of their damn minds. We need people who are in touch with the people so that we can actually get things done. You know, it, 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 there is no point having the people leaving the country who don't engage with the country. Well, don't worry. They are getting things done. The 13 family isn't all of you people chasing after your tool. Like these people are that's in your face right now. They're doing this for the tool. Deception for money. In my opinion. Yeah, it's a great observation. And I've been asking myself the same question, Nick, in the past seven months. You know, a part of me thought... A month ago, you know, let's just give him amnesty. You know, we're going to just reset. And every bad decision you made because... That's right. We're going to do a reset. See, he told you, reset right in your face, didn't he? Yeah, the fourth industrial revolution right out of the United Nations. The Great Reset, which includes massive genocide. Because of COVID, it was a crazy time. Nobody knew what was coming. Guess what? It's all forgiven. But that means let's start making intelligent, science-based... Proportionate. You mean from the people who also are after the tool and controlled by the tool? The phony scientists? Oh, okay. Response to the virus decisions going forward. That's all we ask. And yet we seem to be in... The Sorry, I had a glitch in there, didn't I? Yes, I did. But I wanted to replay this part one more time because this is the reason we're where we're at. This is the exact reason why we're in the shape we're in worldwide. Boys understood it's business. That, that's all it is. It's business. That's all it is, guys. You still don't get it, do you, boys?
Yep, you people still don't get it, do you? Maybe you better listen to him really hard. Because he's going to tell you how we got where we're at. He's going to tell you all about Brian Ross. He sure is. He's going to tell you all about so, so many people worldwide. All of your governors. All of your so-called governments who are nothing more than corporations. He's going to tell you all about yourselves. You all act just like him. And that's how we got where we're at. Because you're all in bed with some people who own what? A man-made construct. And are using it for evil. The root of all evil. It's right in your face. Because there is no excuse for homelessness. There's no excuse for people going without. There is no excuse. You cannot even make an excuse up. Okay? Because there is no excuse. There ain't no countries anymore. No more good guys. That's correct. There is no countries no more. Part of the Great Reset, huh? They're running the whole show. They own everything. The whole goddamn planet. They That's right. Them 13 families own it all. The whole planet. They do whatever they want. And they do. Do whatever they want. Evil. What's wrong with having it good for a change? What's wrong with selling out to everybody for my own selfie self? They're going to let us have it good if we just help them. Going to... If we just help them destroy humanity and help them destroy billions of people's lives and collapse societies and collapse jobs and make more homelessness and more starvation and more wars. If we would just help them do that. Leave us alone. Let's make some money. You could have a little taste of that good life, too. Don't? There you go, and you could have a little of that good life, too, if you're willing to help destroy everybody around you, include yourself, without seeing that you're doing that. I know you want it. Hell, everybody does. You do it to your own kind. That's right. Do it to your own kind. What's the threat? We all sell out every day. There you go. What's the threat? We all sell out every day. Okay, and then I wanted to show you this part from David Icke. Because he's going to tell you some more real truth that you're not going to want to hear. But it is real truth. I already know what it is. Hello and welcome to this video cast and podcast for subscribers to DavidIke.com. One of the key methods that what I call the system or the program manipulates human perception is to give us the illusion of choice. Because surely, if you break down freedom... Pay attention to the wording again, because he's telling you the truth. I don't care who you say he is. It doesn't change truth. Even if he's who we suspect he is, working for the establishment, his job was to tell you the truth. And he's telling you the actual truth. But you're not going to want to believe that, right? Did you all fall in for the illusion? Here you are. What are we doing? Oh, that's right. This is the selection year. Yeah, the illusion. It comes down to choice. Freedom to choose. Freedom to choose, i.e. freedom, is not what the system, the program, wants at all. So, to keep us on the desired tram lines, going in the desired direction, it has to give us the impression that we're making choices, while those choices are being fundamentally dictated. I'll give you an example. If you're hungry, and I give you the choice between an apple and a cake, I could say to you, there you go, you can make a totally free choice, no pressure, nothing. Do you want the apple or do you want the cake? Free choice. Oh yeah, it's good to be free, I've got a free choice. I'll have the apple. But of course, the apple or the cake are not the only choices. There are endless choices of what to eat. And this method is applied particularly to those choices of perception that really 
matter. So what about the choice of who we are, the nature of what we are, and the nature of the reality that we are experiencing? Basically, the system is giving us a single choice between this world is all there is, life's a bitch and then you die, science, what passes for it, and there's a God you must obey, and you must do as you're told if you're going to make it to heaven. And that's another thing. When it comes to the continuation of life or not, it's a choice between non-existence and joining this God under different names, different religions, in heaven. And so we're stuck with a choice between God and non-existence at the end of this period we call life. What he's telling you is the truth. And I know a lot of you religious buffs are going to be mad. You're going to disagree. But that's because you never use common sense. You never use no critical thinking skills. If you had used common sense and critical thinking skills to think about what you're believing in, I'm not saying we don't have a creator. Not at all. Okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your belief other than the fact that, you know, if our creator would have created us and then created his own son, and we would kill our very own creator's own son, own child, the very person, our thing that created us, if we would kill our very own creator's child to think that we wouldn't change the words of our creator, you'd have to be out of your damn mind. You know, I mean, it's it's so, so in your face. Just like when they say, well, what I was taught growing up, when I went to Sunday school as a kid and church, I was taught that God created the earth. God created the animal. Then God created Adam. Then God took a rib from Adam and created Eve. That's right. Okay, and so at that point, then if that was the case, he created the earth. It was brand new. He created an animal. He put an animal on the earth, right? Right, right. And then he put Adam on the earth, and then he took a rib from Adam and created Eve. Okay, so they were the first two humans on the planet. Well, that makes all of his brothers and sisters, doesn't it? Sure does, because... We would have all had to come from Adam and Eve. What if Adam and Eve's skin were black? Then where did I come from? My skin's white. What if they were Asian and slanted eyes? Where did I come from? What if they were white, common white people? Well, then where did the black people come from? Where did the Asians come from? See how nobody practices you? Just all go around that. You dodge that. Yep, let's dodge that, because it can't make sense out of it, so I'll dodge it, but I'll still believe. That's the problem. That is the problem. That's called deception. And we are given the choice, even if people believe that life continues, which it painfully does. Hello? Yes, life does continue. Between God's heaven and uh, hell. Hellfire. And yet, that is not the only choice. They just want us to think it is. Because Correct. Because both, both have a massive effect in controlling people and limiting, suppressing. It sure does. And it just blows me away how you get some people, how you get people up here that are so awake to everything. Really, I'm telling you, they're awake at a great level, like myself, but they're not awake to this. It just blows me away how they can have such good critical thinking skills and examine what's going on around them, but never, ever, ever give a lick 
to this topic right here because it hurts their little feelers because it would go against everything they've ever been well that's exactly it we've all been lied to on a massive scale our entire lives and it's gone on for many 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 decades that's right see he's really telling you the truth right here I don't care what you tell me I know he is their sense of the possible everything is black and white do you want black? Hellfire. What do you want? White. Heaven. As if that's the only choice. So what we're looking at is religion has hijacked the perception of the afterlife. Sure has. Because overwhelmingly that's on its terms. And what we bravely call science has hijacked non-existence after what we call death. And there are other explanations which you rarely, rarely see in the media or in the education system. Correct. And I got on this journey, which is... Uh, taken me through the last quarter of a century because I started to realize that there were other explanations for life, reality, that were very credible and supportive by the evidence. And so I asked, why aren't, why aren't these concepts talked about in the schools why aren't they talked about in the media why isn't science looking at them in the mainstream and the answer that came back as I progress with this is that they were being systematically suppressed and from that I asked well what else is being systematically suppressed and I walked into this massive panorama of global that's right <laughs> that's right knowledge being withheld knowledge being withheld mm -hmm. conspiracy and manipulation that I've been uncovering ever since these other explanations for the nature of self and the nature of life the nature of reality are suppressed because an understanding of them would set us free from the... Correct. Then you would actually find real freedom. ...program set us free from the system and its perception, deception, manipulations. And so they are dismissed as psychobabble, pseudoscience, even though the basis of them is supported fundamentally by what we call quantum physics, which is a branch of mainstream science, that mainstream science has to acknowledge exists, but cracks on as if it doesn't when it comes to its own discipline. So this, um, this theme came to me over the last few days when I read an article in a British newspaper which um, was headed, in an ever more irreligious age, the number of us who believe in heaven, again, here we go, heaven, Christian heaven, Muslim heaven, religious heaven, as if that's the only thing that can exist, if anything does, after death. That the number of us who believe in heaven is going up. We asked distinguished thinkers why do you uh, why do even atheists still believe in life after death and here's the first one uh, a guy called a n wilson an author and biographer of jesus it must have been a challenge we should not be surprised he said that while the number of religious believers seems to have fallen the number of believers in the afterlife has actually risen and once again, there's this assumed connection 
that religious believers have fallen and um, the number of believers in the afterlife has risen. And that's a kind of what's going on when actually um, you don't have to be a religious believer to believe in an afterlife, a continuation of life, in fact. But that's the assumption made. Uh, so when non-religious believers believe in an afterlife, it's like, like this article that it's all about. What's going on? That's strange. It's not strange at all, as I'll come to. So Wilson goes on. Um, selfishness is at the core of modern culture. We are encouraged to believe that our own feelings should be paramount, that we should nurse grievances, feel sorry for ourselves, pick at old childhood wounds, blame our parents, our schools, our financial circumstances for our misfortunes, but never blame ourselves. Well, there's some truth in that, but then comes the next question. What the heck has that got to do with a belief in the afterlife? We go on. Since all the great religions teach the opposite, Wilson says, that wisdom only comes about through a conquest of selfishness, it is not surprising that our modern culture, fed by psychobabble, there we go, should wish to take leave of religion. Um, religions teach that wisdom only comes about through the conquest of selfishness. Well, maybe here and there they do, but they don't practice it most of the time, do they? Yet, he says, belief in an afterlife is consoling to those narcissists. You've got to be a narcissist to believe in the afterlife if you don't believe in religion. Uh, who cannot imagine a future that does not contain them, preferably for all eternity. Once this is appreciated, you will understand why the me culture would wish to discard all the difficult bits of religion, but hold on to the prize at the end. We do not wish to deny our carnal appetites and to curb our selfishness, but that is not going to stand in the way of our insisting that we will live forever. Must invite him to dinner. Then we've got A.C. Grayling, philosopher and master of New College um, of the Humanities. Belief in an afterlife, he says, arises from several powerful psychological causes. One is the sheer incredulity with which people contemplate the suggestion that the vivid consciousness that we experience can completely vanish when bodily functions cease. How can the rich array of our thoughts, feelings, memories and perceptions be extinguished? Well, apparently, according to grading, they can. Um, the fact that we have long periods of unconsciousness when we are asleep should remind us that consciousness is not an uninterrupted phenomenon and its interruptions are evidence that it might well not be a permanent one either. Well, what about all the dreams that we have when we are not? consciously awake and how about our point of attention our point of experience might move to other uh, levels of reality during sleep which the conscious mind um, is not um, directly experiencing another question um, worth contemplating then we've got colin blakemore professor of neuroscience the afterlife he says I could never get my head around those Renaissance images of men with wings and weightless thrones floating in fluffy clouds. How did the anti-gravity bit work? It was symbolic, mate. And most worrying of all, what did the lucky people who qualified to get in do all day? What would they talk about? Would um, there be a decent theatre? and books to read and remember it's forever it all seems so preposterous even rather frightening he says you don't need the fear of god to be a moral person and you don't need the presence of an intelligent designer to explain the universe see human perception particularly in the program is so 
squeezed in terms of its sense of the possible, that it perceives life continuing after this reality in other realities on the basis of other realities being like this reality. So the concept is that you, you, if, if um, life continues, then, well, what about the theatres? Have they got theatres? Have, have they got books? As if, as if the, the world that we're experiencing is the only world of possibility. And these people are dictating the official version of reality of mainstream science. We're living in a infinite, uh, an infinite state of all possibility. This is just one possibility, going to the theatre and reading a book. Anyway, um, Breakmore um, says, um, so why cling to the improbable idea of eternal life? The improbable idea of eternal life. Um, is there anything more improbable than the way science explains how this universe came into existence through the so-called and illusory, ludicrous Big Bang? This is... Um, this is a, um, a definition of the Big Bang. According to the standard Big Bang model, the universe was born during a period of inflation that began about 13.7 billion years ago. Couldn't be more precise, could you? Like a, this is the best bit, like a rapidly expanding balloon it swelled from a size smaller than an electron to nearly its current size, I kid you not, within a tiny fraction of a second. And this guy, Blakemore, says that, or asks the question, why we should cling to the improbable idea of <laughs> eternal life. It's like uh, the guy called Terence McKenna said, a brilliant quote, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. That's the Big Bang. So, um, also in this article is the, the view of the Assistant Secretary General of the Muslim Council. And here he says, uh, for many Muslims, this report would be puzzling. Just as in Judaism and Christianity, belief and reliance in God are the central pathway to a successful afterlife. Indeed, while we are promised ample material rewards in heaven, our religious traditions place a greater value on the fact that after life we would be closer to God. That is our ultimate salvation. Who says all that? Somebody that wrote a book once. Same with all these religions. I think, what, what was that great line um, that um, the great American comedian Bill Hicks came up with about religion? Where they're, they're poring over these religious texts and deciding what they mean. Um, I think what God meant to say. I mean, these books were written by human beings, for goodness sake. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> no, it's all true. No, you, oh, there can't be true. any other alternative. We would kill our creator's own child. <laughs> he goes on. I am also struck by the suggestion that increasing feelings of entitlement uh, may be fueling a rise in believing in life after death, despite not accepting religion or God. You see again... <laughs> Uh, the, the equation or uh, the connection between um, believing in religion and there being an afterlife and believing in the afterlife. You can't believe in one and not accept religion. Crazy, crazy stuff. This is worrying, really. I, I haven't felt that. Especially if it leads, as academics suggest, 
to less spirituality and more individualism. Now, they talk about spirituality. Oh, we must be more spiritual. Here's, um, here's definitions of spirituality. The quality or state of being concerned with religion or religious matters. The quality or state of being spiritual, which is being concerned with religion or religious matters. Something that in ecclesiastical law belongs to the church or to a cleric. See, they've hijacked spirituality. Sensitivity or attachment to religious values. The quality or state of being spiritual, which is the sensitivity or attachment to religious values. And so it goes on. Um, he goes uh, and continues, however, after, before the afterlife, um, we have this worldly life to cherish, enjoy, and in which to do good works. For those with a religious belief, it is also a time to cultivate and plan for a successful harvest after death. Now, this is another um, aspect of this whole religion, God thing. And, and, and you see it in politics in exactly the same way. It's the same scam. What you're looking for, the reward, is always tomorrow. Do what the religion says now. Do what these men in frocks say now. And then you'll have your reward tomorrow. Oh, accept austerity now, say the politicians. Accept austerity now. And you'll have the reward tomorrow. It's like sitting on a carousel horse trying to catch the one in front. It's always tomorrow. It's always too far. It's never now. It's never today. All putting you off, putting you off so to keep you in line and to keep you um, doing what they say you must do to get your reward tomorrow. The Quran... Uh, teaches, he says, and for the Quran, see the Bible, see all of them. It teaches us how to ask from God, quote, our God grant us goodness in this world and goodness in the hereafter and save us from the punishment of the fire. God threatens you with the punishment of the fire if you don't do what he says, because he loves you. <laughs> Correct. I'm always fascinated, he concludes, by how God wants us to first ask for this life and then for the afterlife. Fascinated. Personally, I'm bewildered. I think he says, we call this the best of both worlds. I might call it the worst. But the last one here um, is by um, someone called Libby Purvis. Uh, she's a BBC radio presenter. And um, she's nearer the mark, shall we say. Uh, this is what she said. I was a convent girl raised to believe in the four last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell. So you give them simple choices either that or non-existence, and you've got them either way. The Catholicism was, on my mother's side, counterbalanced by my father being a lapsed Scottish Presbyterian turned atheist. So um, there were two points of view to choose from, which is handy for a child. Not what the sister wants, though. <laughs> Ooh, don't give them choices. They might make the wrong one. Um... She says, but my real luck was reading C.S. Lewis, author of the Narnia books, Christian Fables for Children. I think they were more than Christian Fables, actually, um, and went much deeper than that. Um, in the last battle, the good characters and the wicked ones end up in the same place, she says, but the brave, kindly ones see a marvellous new country spreading out around them, while the baddies simply can't see it. It's called creating your own reality, which can be explained even through quantum physics, how it's done. Um, whenever the kind ones try to persuade them, they remain convinced they are still in a cramped hut. 
In his adult book, The Great Divorce, Lewis expands on this idea that hell is just the inability to see or appreciate goodness, a clenched, furious habit of selfishness. Heaven and God, being the ultimate good thing, can only be perceived and enjoyed if you have tried to follow goodness. And we come back to creating your own reality. What you give out, you get back. It's called cause and effect on one level of this existence. Today, she says, being older and grumpier, I mainly reflect that there is a curious satisfaction in the fact that we can't know what happens after death. Professor Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist and militant atheist, he's actually uh, um, a religious figure, uh, Dawkins. He, he um, castigates religion, official religion, in-your-face religion, but he promotes his own religion of scientism and atheism in the same way as any priest. But they can't see that they're mirrors of each other, just having a different name for their religion. One's called uh, science or scientism, the other one's called Islam or Christianity or Hinduism or whatever. Um, and uh, Purvis goes on that um, they can't prove there's no afterlife. Clerics can't prove that there is stalemate. But she concludes the Lewis idea lingers on, that whatever happens to our consciousness next, if indeed there is a next, uh, depends on how we try to live on earth. We make our own heaven. Uh, we may not have to fear hell fire, but there is a sneaking feeling that if you cultivate a nasty nature, you'll have to go on living with it. So what about a another explanation for life? The one that's marginalized, suppressed, ridiculed. How about that what we are is pure awareness, simply a state of being aware. And these bodies, vehicles, are to allow our awareness to experience different realities. We get so caught in the world that we can see that we can't see that the real self is in the world of the unseen and it's simply about frequency even mainstream science will tell you that of the mass matter that exists etc energy in the observable universe Our eyes can perceive only a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Some say as low as 0.005% um, uh, of what exists in the known universe is all that we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Some say a bit more, but not much. So something like 0.005% of what exists in the known universe is the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light, which is the only part of that 0.005% that we can actually see as a world, Only a fraction of that 0.005% can we actually see. And yet science pontificates about how everything is. Religion pontificates about how everything is from only the perspective of that fraction of the 
0.005%. Why can we only see that ludicrously small range of frequency? Because the body can only, which I call a biological computer, in fact I saw a scientist calling it a biological computer re recently, um, the biological computer, the body, can only decode into a visual reality that tiny, tiny band of frequency. And if we think that despite the tiny amount of reality that we can perceive, that we can make definite um, claims that there is no afterlife, then that's just plainly ridiculous and unbelievably arrogant. There is an infinity of existence beyond this tiny fraction of visual reality that we can perceive. And what's happening is our true self, pure awareness, the state of being aware, is experiencing for what we call a human life that tiny range of frequency. And this is why when people have what are known as near-death experiences, when they, they leave the body, when the body uh, dies and then is revived, they come back in their fantastic numbers now and describe a reality that was vastly different to the one we are experiencing. A reality um, in which past, present and future was all happening in the same moment, the same now, in which they could perceive multiple uh, realities at the same time, and in which the world that they experienced of enormous expansion of awareness of consciousness was beyond words dramatically different to the tiny range of frequencies that we are experiencing through this biological computer in what we call a human life. Consciousness, awareness, is indestructible. It may change, and it's constantly changing. You access that amount of awareness, you're going to have the perception of a P. You expand your awareness, you're going to have a massively expanded sense of reality. And what the system wants to do, the program, is focus that attention into the smallest possible limitation so we become easy to control. And that is the basis of why people are offered the this world is all there is, life's a bitch and then you die science, we're just a cosmic accident, or you've got to do as you're told and behave and do what God wants so that you'll have your reward tomorrow. This is why reality, and I expand on it, massively in the books and the, the talks. This is why the reality that I very briefly outlined is not taught in the schools, is not seen in the media, is not explored by the main body of mainstream science. Because they don't want us to think about that. They don't want us to perceive that we could be infinite awareness having an experience. And in the title of my latest book, the person we think we are our name, our uh, income bracket, our race, our religion, whatever, is a phantom self, not the real self. And what we call our name, our life story, our race, our religion, our income bracket, is not who we are. It is who our infinite awareness 
is experiencing. That's all. David Icke is not me. He's an experience for the infinite me currently. And it's the same with everyone else. And so, in terms of the afterlife, there is no afterlife. And there is no before life. There is just life. And death is not the death of us. It's the end of the cycle for the vehicle, the body, the biological computer that has allowed the real us to experience this reality in what, like I say, we call a human life. So, maybe what this article is all about, um, how come more people are believing in an afterlife, yet at the same time less and less people are believing in religion? Maybe there is an answer to that. Maybe people are becoming more aware of their true self. Maybe it's because of intelligence in seeing the, the nonsense of the limitations of religion and science. Maybe, um, maybe humanity is starting to awaken. And there is where I want to stop this. He's pretty much done. And it comes to show what I've known for a long time. See, I'm not against the fact that we'd have a creator. I'm against the fact that nobody practices common sense or critical thinking skills. You couldn't figure out that all the stories, whether it's the Quran, whether it's the Catholic religion, whether it's the Christian, whether it's the Jehovah, doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter what your religion is. When you compare all of them together, they all go back to the same nonsense. Nonsense! Yeah, it's about control. Always has been. It's to keep you from knowing the truth. And that's what blows me away when I'm watching people that are so awake to so much. But yet, they can't see through this. And it's like, how can you be so aware of what's really taking place but so unaware of this deception. The color purple is for deception. It's used regularly in mainstream media when they're lying to you. That's right. Like Brian Ross when he was lying to you and telling you about a gym and how they stopped the elite. No. And how it's gone global, it's all over the world. We're all fighting back. But everywhere I go, I see nobody fighting back. I see you all believing in the hogwash. It just blows me away. And I put it in your face. Why do you think I showed you the guy that was telling you the real truth? Selling everybody out for the tool. That's right. Selling everybody out for your own selfishness and greed. When I said there's absolutely no excuse for poverty, homelessness, and starvation, there isn't no excuse other than you all want to be above somebody else. That's right. And none of you are brave enough to stand up and stop them. That's what it really comes down to.